everybody. Um, we're going to start now. Um, my name is uh, Joe Lombardo. I'm the coordinator of the United National Anti-War Coalition, which is a coalition of organizations, anti-war and social justice organizations from around the country. Um, we decided to do this webinar today with members of our administrative committee. Not all of them will speak, but I'll just quickly run over who is on the administrative committee of UNAC um, and what organizations they're from. Uh, Bayman Azad is the executive secretary of U.S. Peace Council. Jamu Baraka is the national organizer of the Black Alliance for Peace. Uh, Judy Bell Bello is from the Upstate Drone Action and um, also from Syria Solidarity. Uh, um, Sarah Flounders is from the International Action Center. Margaret Kimberly is also from Black Alliance for Peace and she is also a lead columnist for Black Agenda Report. Uh, Cassie Laham is from People's Opposition to War, Imperialism, and Racism, which is an organization in Florida. Uh, Jeff Mackler is the East Coast Coordinator of UNAC and National Secretary of Socialist Action. Rhonda Romero is the um, uh, Chair of Bion USA, which is a coalition of, I believe, 20 some odd Filipino groups in the United States and affiliated with a uh, the major organization in the Philippines uh, of the same name. Uh, Margaret Flowers is the director of Popular Resistance, and Autumn Lake is um, a member of the Minnesota Anti-War Committee and also represents the newly formed uh, Youth Against Empire um, on uh, our administrative committee. So that is our board and some of the folks are gonna speak a little bit today, short, briefly, and then we're gonna to try to have a discussion about the anti-war movement um, in the period of the Biden administration. Uh, as um, some people may know, UNAC is an uh, organization about 10 years old um, and we were formed because the anti-war movement after the election of um, uh, Barack Obama kind of um, went into a downturn and one of the major coalitions um, ceased to be a coalition, went into being a network. Um, actions were not called so much. A lot of people had faith that somehow um, some of the promises that Obama made, such as closing Guantanamo and ending the war in Iraq would happen, but uh, they did not happen. And new wars started in um, Libya, in uh, Syria, in Yemen. Um, military budgets continued to increase. Um, the uh, um, uh, uh, propaganda attacks and coups for countries that were not um, favored by Washington and Wall Street uh, continued. Um, so uh, today, um, uh, we believe we, um, that the same thing cannot happen with the um, Biden administration, that it would be a big mistake. And if you um, look at the actions of Biden already, you can see that um, uh, this is something that we have to be uh, very cautious about. Um, uh, for instance, his uh, appointments for uh, his cabinet include basically the war hawks from the past administrations. Um, at his uh, um, inauguration, he invited the fake ambassador from Venezuela, the Juan Guaido person um, uh, from the opposition, which is supported by almost nobody in Iraq, but it is supported by uh, Washington. There have also been a lot, an uptick in propaganda and sanctions against uh, certain countries, even the um, Obama signature legislation, which was the uh, um, treaty with Iran. Um, Biden has said now that unless Iran, even though it was the U.S. that broke the treaty, goes back to the provisions that it had under the treaty, um, uh, the U.S. will not uh, get rid of any of the sanctions and will not negotiate a new treaty. So 
um, we have to be clear that we are moving into a period where uh, the anti-war movement has to be vigilant, has to be out in the streets, and has to um, be very active. Um, one of the things that we've done for this webinar and we'll do in our next meeting, um, we have periodic meetings of our coordinating committee, which are representatives from the various um, organizations that are members of UNAC. We decided at our next one, at the end of February, we are going to open it up so that uh, um, uh, instead of just members of UNAC, other organizations and other individuals can come on so we can have a discussion on how to move forward. And to help that discussion along, we developed a, um, a, a, a kind of statement. Um, and I'm going to try to get that statement up right now. And Actually, Mark... Joe, I can do it. I can share my okay. screen. OK. Okay. Margaret. Oh, uh, except I, you have to give me permission. Oh, well, if you tell me how to do that, I will, but. <laughs> just go to where it says share screen and click on that and then. Okay, okay. Should there, I just click on it. you? Okay. No, just down at the bottom where it says share screen, there should be an arrow next to it. If you click on that, it should say allow others to share their screen or something like that. Oh, okay, well, let me just check. Uh, sure. You can also hover over Margaret's name and make her a co-host, and then she can. Yeah, Margaret, I'm going to do that if you don't okay. mind. Thank you. Okay, Margaret, you're now a, a co-host, so I think you can share your screen. Yep, that's working. Okay, Great. so Margaret's going to read the statement we have now, and then we'll have some discussion. Thank you. Yes. And um, discussion at the end. So a call to strengthen the anti-war movement. The Biden-Harris administration made it clear during its transition and first days in office that it will continue the dangerous foreign policies of its predecessors and escalate U.S. aggression and domination around the world. From the cabinet choices, which include torture supporters and architects of the current wars, to the open support for a failed coup leader in Venezuela, and for Trump's devastating actions against Palestinians to escalations against Syria, Iran, Russia, and China, the Biden-Harris administration is a threat to global peace and well-being. As people who live in the empire, we have a responsibility to oppose the illegal actions of the United States government. We cannot allow a repeat of what happened during the Obama-Biden administration when the anti-war movement faltered, allowing drone assassinations, economic warfare, the militarization of African countries, U.S. regime change operation, and attacks on countries such as Libya, Yemen, and Syria. We live in an historic moment when the U.S. empire is fading and the world is facing an unprecedented confluence of crises, a global recession, a pandemic, and climate chaos. As many states in the global community, particularly in the global south, move toward cooperation to solve these crises, the Biden administration is advocating for U.S. domination. The United National Anti-War Coalition, UNAC, calls for immediate actions to build and strengthen the anti-war, anti-imperialist movement in the United States. UNAC commits to the following actions. Providing regular information about the U.S.'s policies and actions providing political analysis from an anti-war, anti-imperialist viewpoint, organizing regular activist education and organizing calls, providing support to organizers around the country, holding coordinated days of actions, and developing and participating in campaigns on specific issues related to the war abroad and at home. So if you aren't already on the UNAC list, I encourage you to go to unacpeace.org and on the right hand side of the home page, you'll find a place to sign up for the email list so that we can keep in touch with you as we carry out this plan. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to have a few speakers, not all the members of the um, UNEC uh, committee, uh, administrative committee will speak. Um, there'll be short talks on various subjects, and then we're going to have a discussion at the end of what you just heard and of uh, anything else relating to the subject or what people will be saying. Uh, please put questions in the question and answer period, uh, uh, question and answer um, uh, icon down uh, at the bottom of your screen, and we can 
uh, then answer them and we'll see how to how we can have a discussion um, amongst ourselves and uh, between each other and see where we can get from here. So our first speaker is going to be Jeff uh, Mackler, um, who is uh, from the West Coast UNAC and Socialist Action. Jeff. Jeff, you're on, on mute. I'm honored to be with you today and very proud to be a part of this uh, diverse um, UNAC administrative committee. I want to review a number of the reasons why UNAC exists, some of its fundamental principles and uh, organizational ideas. The first is we conceive of ourselves as a united front type organization. That is many different groups with different perspectives who come together to bring millions of people into the streets to fight for social justice. Our view is that the history of the struggle for human freedom, liberation, civil rights, democratic rights is the history of the mass of working people organizing independent of the existing power structures in massive actions to demonstrate that they are the majority as opposed to war making political parties that represent the interests of the ruling rich. So we don't all agree on political questions, but we agree to disagree. But here's what we agree on. First, we start with the premise of opposing all US interventions in every nation on earth. We support the right of poor and oppressed nations to self-determination. We reject the idea that the United States acts anywhere as a colonial power. We are against all US wars, drone wars, assassination wars, special operations wars, open intervention wars, sanction wars, and all the other manifestations of a US imperial power that seeks to dominate the world for profit and extraction of resources. By self-determination, that is, we support the right of people to be, of poor nations, to be free from colonial oppression. That's our entire history and the history of any radical movement. We are against the colonization of the Middle East or Africa or Latin America. We say out now and self-determination. But our advocacy of self-determination is not synonymous with agreement with the particular politics of the nation that the United States focuses on. We, for example, have different assessments of the governments of Venezuela or Iran or Syria. But in every instance, we support those governments in their battle against US intervention, and we don't necessarily support the policies of those governments. It's for those governments, the oppressed nations, to decide their leaders and their allies. In regard to Syria, for example, we say that its self-determination rights include the right to seek aid against US imperialist intervention. We support its right to ask Russia and Hezbollah or Iran for help in assisting them in the same way that we oppose all US interventions, coups, sanctions, and military activities against the government of Venezuela. We support Venezuela's right to seek aid from other governments, material aid, military aid, humanitarian aid. In fact, the truth is that the United States embargo of Iran and Venezuela has led to the death and destruction of economic infrastructures in Iran and Venezuela and elsewhere to the tune of millions of dollars in Venezuela, 550,000 people have died. We have no illusions that the Democratic Party is a party of peace. I remember in my youth, there was a debate on whether or not we should support or the movement should support Lyndon Baines Johnson for president or the quote, warmonger Barry Goldwater. Johnson won the election and proceeded to organize a 10 year slaughter in Vietnam that took the lives of literally 4 million people and sent 500,000 troops to that country. But the same LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, orchestrated a 
support to a vicious military coup in Indonesia that slaughtered one million people in 1965. He didn't do this by sending US troops, but he armed and financed the dictator in that country, Suharto. The same thing with US support to the dictatorships in Cuba, the Batista dictatorships, or the Somoza dictatorships, or, this, or the, um, the death squad government of Guatemala that killed 400,000 people. The record of US imperialist interventions around the world is unbroken and remains so today. The Democratic Party is the prime supporter of military intervention. When the Republicans ask for $800 billion, the Democrats in Congress up the figure another 50 billion. The Democrats have joined in on every single war, if not their administrations has led them. The Obama administrations conducted seven simultaneous wars against poor nations of the world. So we ask people to join UNAC. Join us in a united front. It can be any political persuasion you want if you support the right of poor and oppressed nations to self-determination, if you support the simple demand, U.S. out now, if you're with us in fighting against the wars against working people around the world and the wars against working people in the United States, the wars for a clean environment, against global warming, against racism, for Black Lives Matter. That's what UNAC is all about. We want to build the power of an independent fighting movement in the streets to challenge U.S. imperialist policy. Join us. Thank you, Jeff. Um, our next speaker is going to be uh, Judy Bellow from the Upstate um, uh, Anti-Drone Network and also from uh, Syria Solidarity. Judy, you're on mute too. Yeah, you're muted, Judy. Oh, at work, I have a touch screen. I'm always confused because here I reach for the screen and nothing happens. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'm really glad to be here. And I'm really glad that we're doing this webinar because I think everybody needs to think about what's going on right now and uh, to really look at uh, I know I, so many people are just uh, giddy with joy over the Biden presidency, and it's really very sad because uh, he uh, is going to continue the warmongering policies of the United States. And uh, it doesn't look like he's going to do a whole lot for the people of this country either at the moment. Uh, I don't know that you can do both. And he's definitely not, he's already... Uh, stopped following through on any positive policies that he might have uh, asserted during the election. And at the same time, he is um, following through on some very negative things that uh, perhaps go against what he said. So I uh, tend to think about the Middle East. Uh, that's the area I know most about. And uh, what we can see now is, yes, we're already uh, back in Syria and we're not only have we sent more people there, but uh, apparently they're stirring the pot. Uh, and now we have open conflicts in an area which was more or less a frozen conflict only uh, a few months ago. And uh, people are once again dying. So that's one thought. And in Yemen, we see uh, they said uh, they're withholding the funds temporarily from the Saudi and from the um, uh, UAE uh, weapons purchases. But you have to realize that what we're talking about here is what's going to happen in a few years. What's happening right now, there has no constraints. And when they talk about uh, the siege on Yemen, in fact, the U.S. is the major coordinating force, not Saudi Arabia, not uh, UAE. The siege is actually being uh, maintained uh, by American, and, uh, U.S. and uh, European countries. All aid to Yemen has to first go to Djibouti, to an American base there. That's where the U.N. is uh, 
overseeing uh, aid. And so the, a lot of the barriers to aid are generally caused by the United States. Another issue in Yemen that shows that the U.S. is not going to do anything for the people of Yemen is the fact that Israel is now uh, snuggled up on the island of Socotra with the United Arab Emirates, and they are uh, formulating a massive uh, base that uh, is for um, intelligence, intelligence that's going to be used in the wars against the other countries of the Middle East, uh, and they're supporting U.S. policy there, and they're probably getting U.S. support to be there. So there's not really any hope there either. I uh, recently saw a talk by Larry Wilkerson, uh, and he was talking about Afghanistan. You made these really uh, points, some of which I actually had never thought of, about the reason that the United States will not leave Afghanistan and will not allow the war there to cool off. And basically he said, this is in Russia and China's backyard. As long as the US keeps the war going, uh, simmering in Afghanistan, then it feeds uh, um, Chechen uh, rebellions, it feeds Uyghur rebellions, and it generally keeps uh, all the wars everywhere uh, in antagonizing China and Russia afloat. So I don't see much hope, I'm not sure uh, if the U.S. can start a new uh, war or if they need to really. I know that um, uh, President Trump didn't, but uh, there's a couple of options. One is Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, which has been sort of simmering on a back burner, but that is a massive antagonism to China and Russia to have a war there and even more so to Iran since this war is on their border. And it involves peoples that are, uh, also populate areas of Iran. So uh, when they call it an ethnic war, the people of the ethnicities at war there uh, live it also in Iran. So these are really severe uh, issues that the U.S. opportunities that the United States has to keep the hot wars going. As far as I can tell, to summarize what Jeff said just now in a statement, the U.S. has been basically feeding our economy with a massive killing machine for the last, uh, for the entire duration of my lifetime. And this is not going to end anytime soon. So we have to look at educating people and on the fact that uh, on globalizing people's understanding, educating people, internationalizing our activities, and uh, opening up so that we can get some kind of a global movement and so that uh, people in the US can participate in a global movement uh, without uh, being hindered by uh, US uh, uh, restraints on information. So it's really important for us to have information flowing. So what I would like to do, uh, so what I do is I uh, am responsible for the UNAC blog. It's at unac.notowar.net. And on that blog, you'll find information from all of our different organizations and also from experts outside of our organizations whom we respect. And those, uh, it, and it keeps an open discussion of what's happening in the world at large, as well as in this country. So I uh, encourage you to read that blog and to stay afloat of what's going on in the world because we're in a very unstable situation. I've heard predictions from people whose opinions I respect on the international scene that there's gonna be sort of a, a pause while everyone regroups. But I think we have to be ready for the next uh, major uh, escalation in the wars against people in other countries and also against uh, Americans by our own government. So I hope uh, as a group, we can communicate with each other. If you're interested, if you have something you wrote or that you think is important, you can send it uh, to me or to Joe at unac.unacpeace at, unac uh, at, at gmail.com. And, uh, or you can put it on our discussion list and where I'll see it. But we need to uh, keep talking and keep uh, looking for ways to have an open communications in a
country that is rapidly closing down our ability to communicate. So I, I think that's what I have to say for now and uh, I'll, I'll see you to the next person. Thank you, Judy. Judy, would you write into the um, uh, chat the address of the UNAC blog, please? Someone has asked about that. Sure. Um, Again, we'll have uh, discussion and take questions and so forth after uh, the other speakers who will be speaking. And next we have Jamu Baraka, who is the um, organizer of the Black Alliance for Peace. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And thank everybody for being a part of this conversation. Uh, I won't take too long in my uh, remarks, uh, but just to echo uh, what's been said thus far. I think it's important that we remind ourselves, folks, that, you know, this, you know, what the U.S. will engage in, in, their, in the range of, of possibilities that they might try to pursue in terms of advancing their, uh, their interests, or in their interests, meaning the interests of the, of the ruling class, really depends on, on us. It depends on our ability to be able to to organize ourselves and to put a break on their uh, their their agenda, uh, and it's important to remind ourselves of that because if not, it can feel fairly overwhelming when we understand and see that we are up against uh, such a a powerful opponent. But we have to take on this responsibility. Uh, we have a unique uh, strategic uh, advantage being at the center of, of empire. Uh, we know that the wars being waged by the U.S. rogue state are wars against the global south primarily, against the colonized uh, people uh, of this planet. Uh, so we have a responsibility for ourselves and to ourselves, but also uh, to collective humanity. And so we have to remind ourselves of that. I remember that when we started doing uh, South Africa solidarity work, uh, we had one little uh, 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 film called Last Grave at Dembazi. Um, people thought the Nelson Mandela or Mandela was a brand of ice cream. But we built, we organized, we engaged in public education and we built, we built a massive uh, opposition, a massive movement uh, against the white supremacist apartheid government in South Africa. We have the same opportunity here. As Margaret said in the opening statement from UNAC, we cannot allow ourselves to be lulled back uh, to sleep. Uh, we've got to be able to uh, convince people that uh, this Biden administration is pursuing uh, objective interests that are counter to the interests of the people in this country and globally. It means you have to take positions sometimes that are not going to make you very popular, but those positions we have to take. We have to oppose, as Jeff said, uh, all interventions, all U.S. wars. Uh, we have to free uh, and assist in that process of freeing people from colonial oppression. Uh, we want to understand that uh, the agenda of the uh, Biden administration is to try to uh, reassert uh, U.S. and Western hegemony. Uh, they want to revive the U.S.-EU-NATO uh, axis of domination, and we have to oppose that. So, friends, we have a lot of work that we need to do. I'm, I'm going to suggest, though, that we have to have some, some degree of strategic focus. There's all kind of issues we can be dealing with because the U.S. is involved in, in criminality uh, literally worldwide. Uh, we could talk about Syria, we could talk about Haiti, uh, we could talk about uh, Venezuela, for example. Uh, you know, I'm suggesting at this critical moment, we have some, some possibilities to advance um, uh, an agenda, to take advantage of some of their vulnerabilities. One, Afghanistan. The Biden administration has decided that they're going to undermine the so-called peace process in Afghanistan. This is a 20 year conflict. We have an opportunity to make sure that we raise the level of visibility of this issue and to oppose the undermining of that peace process. It means we all have to pull together and develop uh, uh, some messaging 
and exercise some degree of message discipline. Afghanistan, in my opinion, in our opinion, at the Black Alliance for Peace, uh, has to be a, a primary strategic focus. Secondly, the U.S. wants to make, wants to complete its pivot to Asia. Uh, it wants to continue to, to encircle uh, China. Uh, we say uh, we need to raise that issue and tell the people of the U.S. Uh, that uh, China is not our enemy. That basically we're not going to allow ourselves to be manipulated using appeals to white supremacy uh, to, uh, to join uh, the U.S. ruling class in attempting to discipline uh, China. Third, sanctions. We have an opportunity to let the uh, people in the, in the U.S. understand or know about sanctions, it, their negative impact on the entire uh, uh, planet, but specifically in the more than 30 countries uh, that are being targeted uh, by the U.S. Uh, and point out the moral hypocrisy of liberal Democrats in supporting uh, these sanctioned regimes. So my friends, you know, we have to push these ideals. We have to remind ourselves of our potential power. We have to uh, remind ourselves the importance of organization. Uh, so again, join UNAC, join in these efforts to organize ourselves. Let's figure out how we can be more visible in raising these various issues uh, and making sure that we in fact live up to our historic responsibility to ourselves uh, and to the world. Thank you. Thank you, Jamo. Um, again, I want to encourage people if they have questions to put them in the question and answer. They'll get lost in the, um, in the chat. Uh, so put them in the question and answer uh, um, uh, icon in the bottom. Uh, next, I'm going to call back uh, Margaret Flowers to, uh, to say a few words. Margaret. Great. Thank you so much, Joe. And it's really great to see everyone here. Um, I've been appreciating your comments and identifications in the chat. So I wanted to talk about a coalition that many of the organizations that are part of UNAC are part of, and this is the Sanctions Kill Coalition. It came together at the end of 2019, and the website is sanctionskill.org. And this is really critical because over the recent decades, the United States has really stepped up its economic warfare against countries around the world and is now imposing sanctions on 39 nations, a third of them on the African continent, and this comprises one third of the world's population. This is um, perceived, you know, this economic warfare is perceived as a more humanitarian form of war, but these economic wars cause the deaths of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people around the world every year. And so they are just as deadly, if not more, than conventional warfare. But these are deaths that are not as visible as they are when we bomb with drones or things like that. So um, the sanctions kill org campaign has come together with a few tools and things that people can use to learn more about this and to raise the demand to end these illegal economic weapons. In fact, I just want to mention that we call them sanctions, but technically what the U.S. is imposing around the world are called unilateral coercive economic measures because it's something that the United States on its own just decides to impose on another country without any sort of process through the United Nations or anybody like that without any evidence that there's reason to impose these. They're really just imposed as a way to weaken other countries, to make their economies falter and uh, cause division within their countries that the U.S. can exploit for its own interests, particularly for regime change. So um, at a time during the COVID-19 pandemic, when so many countries around the world were coming together in ways to cooperate, sharing supplies, sharing information, sharing medical staff, and the United Nations called for an end to economic sanctions during the COVID-19 pandemic, the United States actually increased its sanctions against countries, particularly against countries like Iran and Venezuela, which are working together to try to support each other outside of the sanctions. Um, so President Biden is now in office and as part of his national security statement, he has a paragraph where he asks for there to be a review 
of the U.S.'s economic sanctions to see if they unduly hinder, hinder the capability of countries to respond to the pandemic. And then there's supposed to be some recommendations issued. Uh, we can say unequivocally that these economic warfare methods have hindered the ability of countries to uh, purchase foods and medication, medical equipment. It's caused their economies to go into hyperinflation and prices, of course, to rise. And so people are struggling to afford the things that they need. It's decimated infrastructure, including access to water, access to energy, things like that. So um, there's no question in our minds that this economic war is hindering countries ability, but we're not confident that the Biden administration will share that same analysis. So if you go to sanctionskill.org, there's a few things that you can do. One is we have a petition going to the White House and the leadership in Congress calling on them to end this economic war. The second thing is we have a new uh, toolkit, Sanctions Kill presentation. That's a very basic presentation. It's 20 slides. It has a sample script. Anybody can give it. And there's also resources on the script, but also resources on the website that you can use if you want to go into more depth. But it really talks about what sanctions are, uh, the impact they have, why they're illegal, how they hurt people abroad and people in the United States, and then what we can do to end them. So I really encourage you to, to check that out, consider giving it to your organization. And if you have any questions, you know, you can contact me. I'll put my email in the, uh, in the email, in the chat. And then the third thing is that we're starting to organize delegations to go to countries to study the impact of the U.S.'s economic measures on them. And the first country we're going to is Nicaragua, We'll be there from February 13th to the 25th, and then we'll be reporting back on our return through a re written report, through a webinar, and things like that. So um, I hope that you'll check that out when we get back. But go to sanctionskill.org, and I'll put links to the petition and the toolkit in there. And you can also sign on to that coalition as an endorsing organization and sign on to get on the email list. So thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. Um, remember to put questions in the question and answer area. Uh, we'll get to them very soon. We have a couple of others who are going to make brief comments. Um, and next, I'm going to uh, ask Autumn Lake to uh, um, uh, sign on. And uh, Autumn is from the Minneapolis uh, Peace Committee. Uh, she is also from uh, Youth Against Empire, um, uh, and she represents Youth Against Empire on the UNAC Administrative Committee. Um, Autumn. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, as Joe said, my name is Autumn Alexandra Lake. I am a member of the Minnesota Anti-War Committee. I also represent UNAC's Youth Against Empire Coalition. Um, so... The reason I'm here to talk today is, you know, the uh, the anti-war movement has kind of had its hands full in the past decade with what seems like a constant cascade of foreign destabilization attempts, interventions, and things like that, uh, propping up repressive regimes such as the Israeli apartheid regime, such as Saudi Arabia. But in the midst of all that, there has been a building uh, conflict, what the U Pentagon calls a great power rivalry between the U.S. and China. Um, the kind that uh, sort of existed between the U.S. and the Soviet Union once upon a time. Uh, those of us, you know, who uh, remember the short time ago that the Trump administration was in power, you know, we remember uh, the disastrous trade war that took place that devastated the U.S. economy, that um, the anti-China sentiment that increased the incidences of uh, anti-Asian hate crimes, like it was very easy to think of like this U.S. conflict with China as an aberration of the Trump administration. But the fact of the matter is that ever since uh, China gained its independence from colonial powers uh, in the mid 20th century, the U.S. has constantly had it out for China, the U.S. and uh, other Western imperial powers. Um, even like going as far back as Richard Nixon, they had these like policies of economic containment to try to limit China's ability to grow and to exist as an independent economic and political entity. And this has been a dramatic failure on the part of the US. Um, 
so much so that in 2012, they, uh, the Pentagon and the <clears throat> other branches of the U.S. government basically decided to do, uh, engage in what's known as the, the pivot to Asia, uh, basically restructuring uh, its foreign policy strategy such that, you know, focus just doesn't entirely shift the focus away from things like destabilizing the Middle East, but uh, it sh shifts towards a strategy of military and economic containment of the People's Republic of China. Um, and we see that kind of manifest in so many ways. We've seen the U.S. back the protest movement in Hong Kong, um, not because of its actual political character, but um, as it progressive or as reactionary, but specifically because it is uh, against uh, the government of the People's Republic of China. <clears throat> uh, kind of like really broad example of like their true motivations here. Um, in 2015, Robert Daly, the director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States, again, the Kissinger Institute, don't laugh, uh, he stated that even if China were to change, even if they were to adapt the U.S. Constitution and U.S. laws wholesale, we should still try to limit their growth purely because we shouldn't have a compare competitor. We must stop them even if it means we have to push them back into poverty. So because China represents an alternative to US -led, the U.S.-led imperial bloc's economic order, um, they are the main foreign policy target of the United States. Standing against U.S. intervention in China thus is a really unpopular position right now because their propaganda campaign uh, against China is so effective. Um, before this pivot to Asia, you know, roughly 47% of Americans had a negative view of China. This has increased to something like 78% in 2020. Um, they've effectively manufactured consent for continued intervention in China. Because uh, <clears throat> countries of the world over, including much of Africa and the Middle East, and even some European powers such as Italy, are finding economic and political relations with China to be much more a favorable arrangement than dealing with the United States and the IMF, which means that China's position as an economic world power is threatening U.S. hegemony. And that's sort of like the main reason that the U.S. has even engaged in this campaign in the first place. It's the whole reason that, <clears throat> that, <clears throat> excuse me, that like, you know, military exercises were even conducted in the South China Sea in the first place. And with how heinous the Trump administration seemed in its measures against China, you know, a lot of people, you know, are relieved that the Biden administration is in power. But unfortunately, Biden was the vice president when a lot of these uh, foreign policy changes towards China were implemented in the first place. He has stacked his cabinet with some of the architects of that of the pivot to Asia, um, including uh, including Blinken, who himself is uh, deeply committed to a further opposition to China and has even stated that uh, the Trump administration's actions against China were the successful component of the Trump administration. When it comes to U.S. opposition to China, the Biden administration represents a continuation, not an interruption, not a stop to it. It is continuing on unabated, uninhibited. <sighs> So with this in mind, it becomes clear that, excuse me, I, I lost my place in my notes. So while the Trump administration did uh, frame things like the COVID-19 crisis as the fault of China, um, while it did stir up the pot uh, in ramping up anti-Chinese sentiment, anti-Asian racism in the United States. It's as important as, as ever for the anti-war <clears throat> anti movement to continue to mobilize and against uh, further U.S. intervention. And it's really unfortunate because like taking the correct stand in this U.S.-China conflict is a really unpopular position. It's one that makes, you know, an anti-war organizer, uh, 
it puts them in a very uh, difficult spot, but even though it's unpopular, it's the right thing to do. And this new Cold War is going to be the centerpiece of US foreign policy moving forward. Um, even as US continues to ramp up uh, conflict with Iran, sanctions and uh, Venezuela, things of that nature, this is going to be kind of the uh, cont continuous conflicts moving forward that will demand a lot of our attention. So it's our responsibility to say no to a new Cold War, uh, regardless of who's leading the charge, whether it was Trump yesterday, whether it's Biden today, and whoever it is tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> and on that note, I would like to say, uh, take a moment to say that I represent the uh, a sub coalition of UNAC known as Youth Against Empire. Um, since the anti war movement has been around for so long, there are so many uh, veteran activists and organizers who have decades of experience under their belt and that can make the anti-war movement a little bit intimidating for a lot of newcomers so um one of the reasons we have this sort of youth against empire coalition is specifically to encourage young activists to uh, get together to uh, join this kind of big movement that has so much rich history and so much uh, wealth of experience to draw upon um, this is especially uh, important since, you know, some of the ways imperialism affects the lives of us as youth um, tends to have a very particular character to it. You know, you'll see hear a lot of people my age talk about how LGBT issues and imperialism are inter intertwined, uh, things like that. <clears throat> so uh, if you are under the age of 35. That's what we're counting as youth in the anti-war movement. If you're under the age of 35, I would really very much look forward to you uh, reaching out to us, joining Youth Against Empire, standing against all manifestations of U.S. imperialism and how it affects the lives of, of working people, L LGBT people, racially oppressed people, and so on. All right, I'll go ahead and hand it off to whoever wants to go next. Thank you, Adam. Um, one of the things as we're talking about what to do in this coming period, it is very clear that um, what we need to do in this coming period is uh, uh, bring more youth into the anti-war movement as leaders of the anti-war movement. And uh, if you go to the UNAC website, unacpeace.org, there is a tab for Youth Against Empire, and you can fill out a form there if you'd like to keep informed about their activity. Uh, it's really a vibrant group of, group of uh, um, young people who are taking the reins and taking the lead of the movement right now. Um, uh, Sarah, I see you came up, and I know you have a time constraint. Is it that you would like to go right now? After that, I believe we have one other person. Would you like to? Oh, I, I thought I was scheduled next. That's why. Okay. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, Sarah Flounders from the um, uh, International Action Center. It's all yours, Sarah. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I'm also uh, speaking to you, uh, having recently uh, published a, a book called Capitalism on a Ventilator, the Impact of COVID-19 in the US and China. And it really is how to push a discussion about an, a complete crisis that everyone here knows that we're in, knows that we're facing, uh, a crisis that has not been seen in our lifetime and yet throughout this lockdown, this pandemic, we continue to function and to organize on webinars, on Zoom, and in the streets. We should remember this past summer, the largest massive wave of demonstrations, I think in US history, certainly in decades and decades in the Black Lives Movement. So this is a time of both enormous surges forward uh, and great crisis of this system. We face a capitalist crisis deeper than 2008, maybe deeper than 1929, where the full weight of it we're still feeling. 
and a global pandemic that's far worse in the US where the infection rate, it's now one in three people in, in the city of Los Angeles across the country. Deaths in the US are the highest of anywhere in the world and so are infections. Now we all know this. This is a system in economic crisis and in a health disaster. Uh, and how we struggle and fight against it in a new administration making great promises and yet it is the same system of oppression and of exploitation around the world and here at home even with all those promises. Globalization and technology are making uh, the world smaller, more connected, this is something we know. We have the ability to speak to those who are struggling around the world and for them to heart here and learn of struggles here. Uh, really mass class solidarity, speaking to countries targeted by US imperialism is so important. And UNAC from its very beginning has always raised the war at home and the war abroad and linking those two together. It's certainly more linked than ever in the growing attacks on China, as Autumn just explained, uh, where there's a refusal to learn anything, even the use of sci a scientific approach, social distancing, wearing masks, uh, taking precautions, and instead is used as an attack. So it comes out in all kinds of ways. Uh, and the, the COVID-19 virus in the US, uh, a country without any public health program. So every state, every city, every county was on their own, whether it was in testing or PPE. And now we see it's absolutely true more than ever in the vaccine. We're hearing the terms constantly about vaccine war uh, distribution racism. What's that, what does that mean? That the vaccine and its distribution, everything that happened with testing, everything that happened with the spread of this virus is being duplicated and replicated in the worst ways, even in terms of the vaccine distribution. Slow, confusing rollout. Black and brown people who face the highest rate of infection uh, yet are at the very back of the line, less than half in terms of who's actually received that jab in the arm. Uh, a rollout that is going to take, we're now told, if all goes well, nine months to a year to vaccinate the population in the US. While vaccination is for profit, 60 to 80% profit on the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines this slow rollout has a lot to do with how to sell on the market. Uh, United States with 4% of the world's population has no plan for the rest of the world, no plan at all. And this is true for the US and for the European Union. They have bought up the share of vaccines far into the future, four times as many vaccines as there are uh, population. And yet for Africa, even with UN purchases, less than 7%. So this is what we mean when we say vaccine wars and distribution racism, distribution apartheid, very important issues for UNAC to address. Uh, we see in the media a ridicule of the vaccines being produced by Cuba, Russia, China, and especially um, whether it is Iran, every country every day and particularly the vaccines coming from China being distributed in Africa, in South Asia, in Latin America. The refusal to see the impact on public health. This is another area where UNAC can play a really important role by linking these struggles up uh, and not ignoring the drumbeat for war that is behind even the vaccines. If our own understanding links these issues, we can explain it to other people. Now, in closing, I wanna bring another issue about how we raise the war at home and the war abroad in a very living struggle. 
along with supporting struggles in Yemen and in Palestine, all and all around the world. Now there is an organizing drive of Amazon workers led by black women workers in Bessemer, Alabama. And it would be a real challenge to think UNAC in, in organizing the war at home, step in solidarity with this organizing drive, with not only union resolutions, community resolutions, anti-war resolutions, veterans resolutions, to thousands, thousands of workers, 6,000 workers are in a desperate organizing drive against the largest, most profitable corporation. What a worker earns, an Amazon worker earns in a year, Jeff Bezos earns in one second. In one second, that's a fabulous wealth. So can we find ways as Amazon to be in solidarity with workers organizing in Alabama and with Indian workers in a general strike and with Yemeni workers in resistance and with Philippine workers who are facing a dictatorship along with the people of Iran and Venezuela and Zimbabwe fighting against sanctions. These are tall orders, but it's seeing the world in a linked organic way. How do we become more and more part of a global movement for change? It's a tall order, but I think we're really capable of it and the, it will make the web of the movement so much stronger. Can we excite workers around the world in an organizing drive that's going on here? in the Black Lives Movement that's going on here, in every surge forward? And can we be standing again and again in solidarity with workers organizing around the world? So this is a, a challenge I, I put forth to uh, UNAC, to everyone here, that, that knowing that we can speak as a movement here at home and abroad, and we know that the Biden administration who has promised no substantial change is committed to denying a health care plan for all or peace for the people of the world. So we are an important challenge to that. Let's link our struggles and build together in every way that we can. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I told Sarah because the book is so important that as I introduced her, I would <laughs> mention the book and I forgot. I'm glad that she did. And Margaret Flowers put it, uh, how you can get it in, into the um, chat. So you could uh, scroll up a little bit um, and you'll see that. But it's basically a book of articles um, of a lot of people, some of whom you've heard speak here today, which uh, uh, called Capitalism on a Ventilator, which shows the different ways in which the U.S. has handled the COVID virus compared to China and other areas of the world. It's a very important book, and um, I'm reading it now, and I urge others to do the same. Um, so uh, our final speaker, and then we're going to go into questions and discussion, uh, is Rhonda Romero, who is the chair of uh, Bion USA, um, which, as I mentioned earlier, is a coalition of about 20 Filipino organizations um, in the United States and affiliated with Bayan in the Philippines. Um, uh, so, Rhonda, I know there was a little strangeness about you getting on, but if you can unmute yourself, I think uh, you can um, speak. Hello, um, can you hear me? We can hear you, can't Great. see you, okay. but we can hear you. I'm not sure why my video isn't working. I'm sorry about that. Um, but thank you for having me and thanks everybody for uh, sticking with us to the end of our speakers list today. And uh... uh oh, Rhonda, okay, go oh. on. We left lost you for a minute. Okay, am I still here? Yes. All right, great. Oh, and the video is working now. Look at that. All right. Um, so I'm really glad to be here and actually um, happy that I'm following uh, Autumn's presentation uh, because I'm going to be talking about how um, the pivot to Asia policy uh, and this so-called great powers conflict between the U.S. and China uh, is impacting the Philippines and the Philippines being in a really strategic place in Southeast Asia, um, 
strategic in terms of this so-called pivot to Asia and the, the rivalry that's heating up between the US um, and China. So it's become an even more important place of struggle, um, even though you know the Philippines actually for over a hundred years has been uh, an important place to the US. Uh, now, as Jeff and Ajamu and others have said you know, throughout this webinar, um, US foreign policy has been very similar uh, throughout the years, whether it's been a Republican or a Democrat in office. And this is definitely the case when it comes to the Philippines. Um, since 1898, when the U.S. first uh, went to the Philippines to colonize it, um, the policy has been the same. It's about been about protecting and advancing U.S. imperialist interests in um, the world, and in particular, in that part of the world. Um, you know, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, the U.S. sought to acquire colonies to claim territory in strategic locations along with the resources and the people living there. Um, it's exactly the same today, trying to maintain its hold in the Asia-Pacific region, uh, which is, you know, the center of trade routes that are so important um, to, you know, a sixth of the world's populate, total population to, uh, you know, billions and billions of dollars in um, so-called, you know, investments and interests um, to U.S. imperialism. It's all located there. Um, the Philippines is, is central to that. Uh, we're about 3,000 miles away from China, which is much closer than the U.S. is to China. And so it's a really important place um, that the U.S. would like to continue to, while it's not a direct colony anymore, continue its kind of neo-colonial hold on the country. Um, so all of this didn't start with the so-called pivot to Asia strategy that was unveiled under the Democratic Obama, Biden, Hillary Clinton administration in 2012, but it has definitely intensified since then and could really intensify further uh, given the clear messaging that Biden is putting out, putting out about China as the US's uh, primary rival, which Autumn explained earlier. Um, but just to like even take it from the words of Biden himself uh, in a, a speech that he made to the State Department two days ago on February 4th, which actually happened to be the anniversary of uh, the start of the Philippine-American War when the U.S. invaded our country. Um, so Biden said, uh, American leadership must meet this new moment of advancing authoritarianism, including the growing ambitions of China to rival the United States. Um, so clearly pointing out China. Uh, and when he talks about advancing authoritarianism, he wasn't referring to authoritarian uh, leaders like President Duterte in the Philippines, who is supposedly a, uh, an ally of the United States. Uh, he talked about uh, this is Biden again, will take on directly the challenges posed uh, to our prosperity, security, and democratic values by our most serious competitor, China. Uh, by leading with diplomacy, we mean engaging our adversaries and competitors diplomatically where it's in our interest and to advance the security of the American people. Um, you know, so this whole thing, you know, he's really naming U.S. Uh, imperialism's number one rival as China. Um, it kind of, you know, predicts full-blown implementation of the Asia-Pacific pivot. Uh, the pivot will be all about protecting American interests in the Pacific uh, from a takeover by China. Um, and, you know, one thing that I know we in the Philippine National Democratic Movement like to say is that when Biden or, or Trump or any of the American presidents have talked about America's interests, he's not talking about the American people, the working people of the country. He's really talking about the interests of the multinationals, about America's imperial interests in uh, the area. Uh, and then, you know, just, you know, two more points from Biden's speech the other day. Uh, he said that Defense Secretary Austin, so the new Secretary of Defense, will be leading a global posture review of our forces so that our military footprint is appropriately aligned with our foreign policy and national security priorities. Um, you know, based on the experience in the Philippines that we've had, we're sure that this, you know, posture, um, review and alignment with foreign policy and national security pri uh, priorities really means making sure the military footprint will be created by boots in Asia, um, since China is the top foreign policy and national security priority. Um, 
And then, you know, just finally, the final, some of the final words that Biden gave that day was um, about his take on diplomacy. Investing in our diplomacy isn't something we do because it's right or it's the right thing to do in the world. We do it in order to live in peace, security, and prosperity. We do it because it's in our own naked self-interest. Um, so if it, you know, if we weren't clear before, we should be clear now. Biden said himself, this is about uh, self-interest and not the self-interest of the American people, the working people of our country here, but the naked self-interest of um, U.S. imperialism. Um, um, so, um, so alliance of Filipino organizations like the Philippines, um, and you know, why should it be important for the anti-war movement to take a stand on this, um, you know, movement to uh, demonize China and the the warmongering that's happening there? Um, the U.S. has historically used countries like the Philippines um, as its staging grounds for uh, wars of aggression throughout the world and definitely in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, up to this point, even before to Asia policy, there have been uh, military agreements put in place that allow for like flexible deployment of U.S. troops um, to the Philippines and other countries in the area to be able to conduct massive bilateral and multilateral military ex exercises with thousands of troops, of um, American troops, with Philippine troops in, you know, the sovereign waters of the Philippines, on the sovereign land of um, the Philippines, um, you know, as staging grounds for, you know, these war exercises and war games, um, which really terrorize the people in the country um, and devastate the environment, the land, the water, and, you know, pollute the, the area. Um, you know, for these these war games, um, the U.S. through these different um, military agreements is also able to base its troops there, uh, its ships there, its arms uh, in our country without even having to have um, you know U.S. owned physical bases. So they use these kinds of arrangements to make it very flexible. They use uh, Philippine military encampments. Uh, and then, you know, they can say that, no, we don't have bases in the Philippines. We are just there visiting um, on the invitation of the Philippine government. Um, it's, yes, it's bullshit. <laughs> As I think some people are, are saying out there, um, you know, it's clearly using, um, you know, the country to its own advantage. And it's definitely violating um, the national sovereignty of the country. Uh, and then, you know, finally, um, the U.S. also has arrangements where military aid and humanitarian aid are combined into packages. And so humanitarian operations that the U.S. may conduct in the Philippines are all implemented and provided under um, the supervision of the military. Um, so, you know, some of the reasons um, these things we believe are really important for the anti-war movement to be aware of and take a stand on are that um, you know we should be campaigning against uh, any further military agreements which allow these kinds of arrangements to happen. If it can happen in the Philippines, it can be expanded upon in other countries and allow the U.S. to be able to send its uh, troops and ships and arms um, to other countries against the will of the people um, to make it easier for them to launch wars of aggression or any kind of military actions. Um, and then finally, I, I wanted to say that um, all of this, of course, happens because the government in power in the Philippines is supportive of this agenda. They um, benefit from it. They get lots of kickbacks. It's totally corrupt. And right now we have a fascist dictator in place, um, President Rodrigo Duterte, who has become notorious for the uh, killings and his so-called uh, war on drugs, killings of um, 30,000 people there. Um, but then also for the, you know, hundreds of killings of activists um, who have taken a stand against his policies that have um, supported um, U.S. Imperialism, imperialism, essentially. Um, so assassinations of political opponents, the um, arrests and detention on trumped up charges of political opponents, um, labeling uh, people uh, who are activists or who just, you know, are vocal against the government as terrorists and giving shoot to kill orders to the police uh, and military to um, take these 
people out who are arbitrarily labeled as terrorists. Um, and I have to say that I'm actually one of those people and most of the executive committee uh, of Bayan USA, an overseas organization, um, have actually been labeled terrorists and we are on government websites um, uh, where we are tagged as terrorists. And so if you know we were to step foot in our home country, uh, there would be uh, you know, license to arrest, you know, in the, the best case scenario, or potentially even shoot to kill. You know, and these are the people that the U.S. or Duterte and these kinds of policies have been um, supported by the U.S. Um, under Trump. We are trying, we are waiting now to see what will happen under Biden. You know, will he really take a stand against the authoritarianism that he's been talking about, or will he um, continue to support Duterte uh, with the um, millions and millions, tens of millions of uh, dollars in uh, military aid to his government because he needs the loyalty of um, the Philippine government in order to be able to ensure that the Philippines can still play a role in the U.S. pivot to Asia. Um, so, you know, what are we asking for? Um, we're asking for the anti-war movement to be in solidarity uh, with calls to uh, end U.S. support to the Duterte regime, um, to end U.S. support to the Philippine military and police who are committing these uh, atrocities, um, and to, you know, support calls coming from the movement for, you know, freedom for political prisoners, um, ending of the killings, justice for the victims. Um, and then beyond Duterte, we would like to work with the anti-war movement here to um, find ways to end these unequal, unfair military agreements and treaties, which allow the U.S. to continue these kinds of operations um, in violation of uh, the sovereignty of our country. And we think that would actually be a huge contribution to building um, uh, an anti-war movement that is, um, you know, can draw, we can draw lessons from uh, and build the anti-war movement um, in solidarity with people's struggles for uh, national uh, sovereignty and self-determination. So thank you very much. And I'm really looking forward to the Q&A today. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, I'm going to just put up a gallery view, and if folks want to turn on their um, uh, cameras, then everybody can see you all who's here, and um, you can answer questions as they as they come up. Um, there were a number of questions that have um, uh, been put in a question and answer, and I'll try to summarize them or put them together in some ways that, that seem to make some sense. And please put other questions there. There's also been a lot of discussion that we've seen in the, um, in the chat. Um, I think we're missing a couple of folks that were here. Sarah is either not on or, or uh, Mr. Bayman uh, Azad was on from the U.S. Peace Council. Uh, I don't see him here and also Margaret um, Kimberly and Cassia Laham are other members of the coordinating committee. It was asked whether or not this will be, this is being recorded. It is, and it will be on the UNAC YouTube channel and other places. There's Bayman. Um, and Bayman, please, and if you have any uh, comment, please um, just uh, chime in. Uh, and um, it was also mentioned that uh, some other, uh, well, so I was seeing that some other groups were in the chat. Um, Veterans for Peace um, uh, was here. Jerry Condom, a, a former president. Veterans for Peace is also a member of UNAC. World Against War um, was in the chat. They are also a member uh, of UNAC and a number of other organizations. I encourage everybody to go to their websites and um, uh, see what they're all about. So, um, uh, there's a, a number of questions that I got um, uh, here. Uh, um, uh, Jamal, uh, it was one um, that was geared towards uh, you. You said they said you identified three areas that we should concentrate on. Uh, someone wanted some more detail on why you think those particular areas are important. Um, there was another question, which maybe Jamal can lead into and, and others can do also, is why do we talk about the wars at home as well as the wars abroad and what actually does that mean? So Jamal, would you like to start with, uh, with that discussion? 
Yes, uh, I collapsed both of those questions. Um, I, I think that um, just just to restate, um, I think Afghanistan is important because it is um, more immediate in terms of of being able to demonstrate that there is a constituency uh, that is opposed to undermining that uh, that process. It's important because we know this is. Uh, one of the longest standing conflicts that the U.S. has been involved in and that uh, there was the real possibility that there, were, there could be some kind of, of agreement that would allow for US, U.S. troops to be withdrawn. Now we know that that's a very complicated situation. Uh, and I think someone already alluded to the fact that there are some serious reasons why that in fact may not happen. But because it's so immediate, um, I think it's something that the, the, the movement, the anti-war and anti-imperialist movement um, should really concentrate on. Uh, I think sanctions, again, are important because of the impact that they are having in the midst of this global pandemic uh, and the attempts on the part of various nations to try to deal with, uh, with the consequences of this pandemic while simultaneously having to deal with these uh, draconian sanctions. So the, uh, the morality of that um, is something that can be raised, especially in light of what we know will be the strategy of the Biden administration to try to use so-called soft power, you know, this, 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 this BS hustle of, of, of pretending like the U.S is supposed to be the champion of, 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 of human rights uh, and decency. We all know that's all, you know, that's, that's BS. Um, but because it's BS, we could, uh, we could definitely take advantage of the fact that um, they want to pretend uh, that they are the champions by raising these contradictions. Um, and of course, I think a few people have alluded to the situation with uh, the whipping up public opinion against, against China. Um, for no other reason than China is the major competitor uh, to U.S. capital. So, you know, these are, I think, some of the main issues. Uh, there are other issues, of course. I'm just suggesting that we have to be strategic. Uh, we're going, we have to continue to work on all these various issues, including issues around the military budget, for example, uh, and all of the other places where the U.S. is engaged in, in criminal activity. We also have to, this relates to the second question, to make those connections between our anti-imperialist work uh, globally and the war being waged against uh, colonized and oppressed and working class people within the US. We understand that we are part of one global system and that uh, is, is absolutely uh, necessary for people to make those connections to understand that you, know, you can't allow uh, uh, folks to pretend like Black Lives Matter uh, in the U.S. Uh, while while they are um, uh, executing a policy in Venezuela that has a, a, a devastating impact on Black lives in that country and the lives of everybody in that country, you know, uh, or we can't allow them to pretend like they're so concerned about uh, about uh, Muslims and travel uh, while they will simultaneously give unfettered uh, support to the brutality of, of the Israeli settler state. Uh, so, you know, we have to raise these contradictions uh, continuously. Uh, and so we do in the Black Alliance of Peace right now, we have two, two uh, actions. Uh, one is to uh, call attention to the uh, Department of Defense uh, 1033 program, which is the program responsible for militarized and police forces across this country. Uh, Biden and his, his uh, paternalistic uh, nod towards so-called racial justice said that he's going to reverse the reversal of the Trump administration to that program. Uh, you might recall that the Obama administration made some cosmetic changes to the 1033 program, stopping certain uh, categories of equipment uh, to be transferred, purely cosmetic. Uh, Trump came in, he, re he reversed that. Now Biden wants to reverse that reversal and then call it a victory. We say, no, we say shut down the entire program. 
So we have actions, uh, in particular, a petition right now, where we're asking people to go to the Black Alliance of Peace dot com and sign. And we also have a petition, again, raising this issue of Afghanistan. Uh, and we have a petition there. So making the connection, understanding that uh, the war being waged uh, against uh, the people uh, has different fronts. Uh, one front is, is on the global uh, level in various nation um, states. And the other front, of course, is right here in the middle of the empire. Sorry, anybody else want to comment on that? I will. Okay, Jeff, go on. <clears throat> if you look at yesterday's New York Times as a front page story or a major story about Biden announcing changes in the policy on Yemen, saying that they are no longer going to support the uh, Saudis genocidal war against the people of Yemen, which they have been supporting for years. With no comment, the United States says it's no longer going to provide logistical support. And that is the United States satellites and drones provided the targets for the Saudi government to slaughter Yemeni people. This is the same Saudi Arabia that the United States relied on to organize and send thousands of jihadist troops to destroy the infrastructure and occupy two thirds of Syria and kill a half a million Syrians. This is the same Saudi government that for decades has been the second largest recipient of US aid next to Israel in the world. At UNEX founding conference, we took a bold step that made us the first in the country, national anti-war organizations to say, end all aid to apartheid Israel, military, political, diplomatic. People said, how can you attack Israel? Isn't that anti-Semitic? And our attitude was, we have the same exact attitude towards the Zionist Israeli settler state than we do towards the colonial occupation of poor people uh, in every continent on earth. We are against the colonization of the imperialist powers of Africa and the Middle East and Latin America. And we are against the US backed colonization of Palestine, which before 1947 was some 95% Palestinian. And today the Palestinians are relegated to a non viable Bantu stand that is a tiny percentage, perhaps 5% of their original homeland. It has nothing to do with the false charges that were anti Semitic and everything to do with the right of self determination of oppressed people. US hands off now. So we are for a democratic and secular Palestine. The same thing with every country. Within UNAC, we have honest differences that we discuss informally and sometimes formally on many questions, on many governments, whether it be China or Venezuela or whatever. They are all respected and welcome in the framework of UNAC saying US hands off. I'm one of those people that Autumn referred to who is uh, under 85 years old. Is that what you said, 85 or was it 35? <laughs> Close enough, don't worry about it. <clears throat> But I am old enough to remember the Vietnam War, which took place at the middle of this, the McCarthy era, where anyone who was a radical or a socialist was red baited just because they were for bring the troops home now from Vietnam. We don't live in that era, which is the single issue out now from Vietnam. And John o hit it right on the head. You can't talk about opposition to a trillion dollar war budget when we know that money could solve the problem of healthcare in the United States, could make a huge dent in 
the environmental crisis that we face and every other social crisis. One more point, until 20 some odd million people mobilized this past summer in defense of Black Lives Matter, there, was, there were very few people in the country who ever used the term systemic racism. Racism is now recognized as an inherent part of the system of capitalism. And that's only because 20 million people led by the black struggle movement and aided in the time of a great pandemic by millions of white supporters demonstrated that the systemic racism in the United States was intolerable, unacceptable, had to be opposed and challenged. And the reactions of millions of people in the streets did things in a matter of days that for decades were impossible. Congress decided to take down the Confederate uh, statues in the Congress, uh, in the House of Representatives, where we honored the slaveocracy. Statues came down and people began to talk about defend, defunding the police and the nature of racism in American society. That was a product of millions of people in the streets. Those are the people UNAC identifies with. Those are the people we want to join with, form alliances with, and mobilize with. Jeff, can we get some other folks in here? Yeah, I'd like to respond on this. I just want to, um, uh, uh, there's a bunch of other questions, but there's two which are more generic. And uh, I wanna, did you want to answer that question? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, Sarah, I why don't you do that? And then we'll get to the more generic ones and, All right. and we'll get to those. Uh, this is really on connecting, uh, as, as Jamu handled very well, Jeff, um, the war at home and the wars abroad, because unless we understand and challenge the wars at home, we really won't have the, the tools and the ability to, to understand the propaganda about the wars abroad. And, and just to give an example, um, the largest prison population in the world is right here in the US. More than, it's almost two and a half million people huge tens of thousands of people, even in solitary confinement and in special holding cells for Muslim prisoners. Unless that is addressed, up comes the question, let's say like Xinjiang in China. Now, why is the US raising this issue? The United States military has made war on Muslim people around the world absolutely in Afghanistan, right next door to Xinjiang, in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, in Yemen, threatening Iran every day. And they wanna flip the question to make it seem that they are the defenders of Muslim people somewhere and the defenders of raising prison populations when this is the prison house right here in the US. So. Unless we're challenging one, we can't see the sometimes the absolute hypocrisy and distortion uh, that is raised abroad. And, and it is in the linking of those struggles that we can have a better understanding about how US propaganda and whipping up and trying to turn people around and flip the question, how that works. They wanna mobilize people in the US to hate people abroad. And I think Autumn really addressed this, uh, this question of the rising anti-China sentiment, real propaganda that is consciously pumped in to the population here again and again. Uh, and it's pumped in also in ways to make us uh, not see that, that the conditions here are becoming much, much worse in terms of austerity, in terms of a declining life expectancy dramatically, uh, and, and in terms of uh, declining in educational standards, infrastructure, all kinds of things by making uh, opponents all around the world. So I think we are stronger and clearer when uh, we both are addressing wars right here at home and showing the real links 
uh, of solidarity with people's movements around the world. Thank you, sir. Um, I just want to mention, as I said earlier, when we started this program, that uh, the next um, UNAC meeting of our CC is going to be an open meeting for anybody to come on to where we're going to discuss some of these uh, subjects. We'll be at the end of February and everybody will be able to really interact with each other in a, a, a better way and we can talk about this. But I want to ask two questions that were raised here. There's some other ones which I think are very important, but let me start with this one um, and then raise one more which it goes directly to UNAC's role and what we, we need to be doing as an anti-war movement. Um, one person asked based upon, uh, I guess, Autumn's presentation on how does the anti-war movement get more um, youth active in the movement? And perhaps Autumn could start that off and maybe Rhonda could help chip in there too because Rhonda's organization um, has a youth group with it, which is very large and been very, very active. And maybe they can give us some tips on um, the best way to do that and uh, bring more youth into the movement and more youth into leadership of the movement. So Autumn, would you like to start that? I would love to start that. Sorry, I have, um, I have a child in my arms that's making things a little difficult, but bear with me. Um, so when it comes to engaging youth in the anti-war movement, um, <clears throat> just like with any other movement, um, you uh, recruitment often entails like specifically engaging them where they're at and what's important to them. You're going to find that a lot of youth are intensely concerned about the climate crisis. For people my age, that means that you know, uh, the, the climate crisis is a particular, uh, an issue of particular importance because that's something we will see in our lifetimes. That is a catastrophe that we will live through if it is not addressed. Being able to draw the links between the anti-war movement and the movement for climate justice um, is a critical way of engaging the youth <clears throat> specifically especially like noting the fact that the US military is one of the world's, is the single largest uh, polluting entity in the world. It, the US military produces 5% of the world's carbon emissions. Just that one political entity does this. Um, additionally, like you have to read the room with other things that youth are focused on because like let's be honest like the movements for immigrant justice and the movements for black lives are always going to be on people's minds especially again people my age um being able to point out that the reason we had such an intense migrant caravan coming from honduras specifically because in 2009 the u.s destabilized the country so severely that it created that refugee crisis um drawing links to the fact that like the war on black lives is not just restricted to the United States. The U.S. wages war on black lives globally. We're, um, the U.S. still has operations in several African countries, including Somalia. Um, <clears throat> uh, sanctions often affect uh, black folks living in other countries, including, as Aj Ajamu mentioned, Venezuela, um, including Bolivia. These are kind of the side, the uh, the is other issues that a lot of people my age I've noticed tend to be more engaged with. Um, the second thing is I recall personally a few situations I've been in where there were movement veterans, you know, asking, "How do we get youth more engaged? How do we get them involved? How do we get their attention?" And there are youth in the room, myself and a few others included, who are not asked. Like, you know, I'm no rocket scientologist, but I feel as though if you want to know how to get the youth involved, if you want to know what they care about, if you want to know what makes them more inclined to participate, they might be the right people to ask generally. You know, again, uh, I'm no expert, don't quote me. But uh, 
generally I think that's the right move. Um, others with successful experience, I'd be very interested in hearing what you have to say on the subject. But while I do have your attention, I will once again plug the United Youth Against Empire. If you are <clears throat> a younger person looking to be in the anti-war movement, we would love to have you. We would love to have our little space where we can address issues in a very particular way. And I'll go ahead and pass it on to the next person. Sure. Um, I think, Joe, you asked if I could say a few yes, words. Did, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So for um, for Bind USA, we're, we're by no means a youth organization, but the majority of our members are young people, uh, and they're almost all Filipino young people. And when you ask them why they're involved, one answer that always comes up is that they are um, trying to address the reasons why they're in this country in the first place. Uh, and so much of that is because of the militarization in the Philippines. So much of it is because of um, U.S., uh, the colonial legacy, you know, which has kept the country in poverty and is the main reason that people have to, to leave. It's, you know, they're, um, they're forced migrants in order to find a place to survive where they can earn enough to make a living for their families. Um, and so the, the youth who end up here in the United States um, kind of understand are trying to understand it. They're trying to understand why they're here. Uh, and then, you know, once you start talking to them about that, it becomes easy to connect issues of, of war and militarization in other parts of the world to issues of the, you know, exploitation of um, migrants and uh, people of color in this country by the same empire. Um, and so you kind of meet them, you know, where they're at, exactly what Autumn said, and you ask them, you know, what they care about addressing, what they care about um, getting involved in. Um, and part of it is understanding their roots. And then the other part of it is addressing their situation here. Why is my family still poor, even though we're in this country? Why is it that I still can't get uh, a job to make ends meet, or I have to work several jobs to make ends meet while I'm trying to go to school? Um, and those issues, you know, I think like Sarah said, it's it make it there. We have to make those connections between the um, the way people are exploited by the machine um, in this country and abroad, and how it's you know all connected. Uh, so I think. Those are just the initial things. And then the other part of it is, um, yeah, ask them. <laughs> ask them what they care about. Ask them why they got involved and um, have them be part of the leadership of your organization. I'm actually the oldest person um, in the leadership of Bayan USA. Uh, most of the people in the leadership of our alliance uh, reflect our youth membership. Um, they are uh, mostly 35 and under. Um, I think we have one person, no, no, nobody in their 40s. So I would say, yes, I am by far the oldest. Uh, and uh, it makes a difference um, to bring youth in to organizations when they actually are leading the group um, and helping to make the decisions for it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, it, does anybody else want to um, answer that question? I'd also encourage people to be brief so we can we can answer a couple more. Um, anybody else? All right, I'm going to ask two more questions. And then um, the first one is uh, um, civil liberties. We haven't mentioned civil liberties much, but civil liberties seem to be under attack. Uh, someone mentioned the Palestinian struggle. A number of us know that recent posts on uh, about the Palestinian struggle have caused things like our Facebook accounts to be frozen, um, uh, uh, losing the Facebook accounts. We all know the attacks that are happening to Julian Assange, largely because he informed the world of U.S. war crimes in Iraq. Um, and uh, Chelsea Manning, of course, and uh, um, others. We've, we've um, learned that the U.S. basically spies on every single member of the every single person in this country and most people around around the world. Um, uh, during this period, we've seen a step up of attacks from Twitter and Facebook, um, mainly with a leaning towards um, stopping the right wing, 
but uh, at least that's what has been verbal, but we've all felt similar attacks coming from the left. Does anybody want to comment on the civil liberties issue? And again, so that all who want to comment, I'd encourage people to keep it short. Judy. Uh, I'll just start the ball rolling here. For one thing, uh, you're talking about civil liberties, but I think also about communication. And uh, in this country anyway, I think our civil liberties are gonna be attacked on more than just communication issues. But for now, I noticed there was a question about the internet being shut down. Well, I don't think the internet, shutting down the whole internet would be, uh, would go against the, uh, um, would go against the interests of the governing parties in this country. What they're doing is they're putting a firewall between the uh, conversations of activists and the assertions of truth tellers and what the general public is allowed to learn. So Facebook is more and more being neutralized as a communication facility for us, but it's not being shut down, it's really being neutralized uh, and the activists are being excluded. The same is true of uh, other social media and it's gonna get worse. Uh, I think that one of the things we have to look at is how do we open new channels? Because uh, this is also related to the demonization, the demonization of China, the demonization of uh, Maduro in Venezuela, the demonization of Bashar Assad in Syria. And it goes back uh, to the demonization of Iran uh, back uh, in the early 2000s. And of course, we can go all the way back to McCarthy and the demonization of the Soviet Union. Uh, the last uh, few years under Trump uh, where uh, uh, you know, Putin and uh, Russia are demonized. But the a whole situation is that they want to drive out uh, the reality of the people living around the world. We haven't seen it so far. And with the Black Lives Matter movement, instead of seeing demonization, uh, like we did back in the 60s, uh, uh, what's happening is they demonize the people that are working strongly against UN, US interests and they co-opt the people that they think they can bring in and uh, you know, uh, increase their lives. So I think that we really have to work hard to uh, stand up for our issues. I, I mean, uh, in the community I live in, the anti-war movement was completely capsized by the demonization of Syria and Iran. Uh, because these issues were not allowed to be discussed. Now we have this happening in a larger sense on Facebook, you know, and uh, maybe Twitter eventually. For now, Twitter is still functioning as a, a good uh, communication uh, source. But one of the, so what we need to do is make sure that we keep our own channels open where we're sharing information with people within our own organizations and also beyond them uh, about issues that are demonized. And because this is a way to keep a spider web going of information that is being shut down uh, in the general sources. So I hope that uh, all of us will not A, capitulate to this uh, demonization uh, as, uh, and um, I think that both Ajamu and Sarah made really good points about the fact that, uh, you know, by, by demonizing these other uh, scenarios, we're actually like making the US, we're, we're enforcing the lie that everything's okay here. Thank you, Judy. Anybody else have a comment on that? Just briefly, Joe, I, yes, I, would, come I, on, I echo uh, Judy's concern. I think, I think the um, censorship that we are facing in, in the US is really the most uh, critical issue we are in fact uh, facing as a movement, uh, the most dangerous that we have faced in quite some time. You know, we, we have to re understand that, you know, containment is really one of the main ob objectives of the, of, the, of the state. And when we talk about the state today, we have to 
uh, understand how the state has changed, how it has incorporated what uh, some refer to as the uh, ideological apparatuses. Uh, and the main ideological apparatuses incorporated into the state are the corporate media and these big tech companies. Uh, so they are now imposing a, or attempting to impose an ideological conformity on the population because of the deep legitimation crisis that we are facing. And it's very, very dangerous because what they have done is they have conditioned people over the last four years to actually uh, call for censorship themselves. So we have to speak out uh, constantly, boldly in opposition uh, to these efforts by the corporate state uh, to impose itself on, on us. This is something that we, we cannot play with. We've got to be consistent um, and, and quite clear in our opposition. You, you, you're muted, Joe. <laughs> any, censorship. Um, any, any other comments on that before we move on to the final question? Uh, it, it, yes, Jeff. <clears throat> briefly, um, we're supposed to have free speech in this country. Facebook and Twitter preside over a private network that is in contact with a hundred billion people. It is essentially a public institution masquerading as a private body. When they push a button, they exclude us from talking about anti-war and Palestine and other things on the grounds that they are a free speech organization exercising their rights to decide who gets to speak. I don't think in the modern era we can accept that premise, nor do I think we can compete by setting up our own networks. Our networks contact a relative handful of people. We've had almost 200 people on this call and we'll go into the thousands when we get to YouTube. But one tweet on Facebook gets to 80 or 100 million people worldwide. And the corporate media that controls these, their multi-billion dollar operations, pushes a button and we're out. One of our solutions is the old fashioned way. We get into the streets and we organize a million people, which we've done. And if we can't use Twitter, we do whatever we can to show the contradiction between what the majority of people think when they're in the streets, where we go to them with leaflets and door to door and talk to millions through our organizations and what the government thinks. One of the questions I wanna comment on and then I'll quit. is someone asked whether or not we basically live in an Orwellian world, we do live in a Potemkin village world, a Truman Show world, or as Ajamu says, a world totally dominated by the corporate media, where they create a reality that does not correspond to the truth about life for millions of people, if not billions around the world. That's why our method is mass action, mass communication, publications, newspapers, flyers, and challenging every inch of repression. Joe hit it on the head, you know, uh, on, on February 22nd, we're gonna have a webinar with Alice Walker and Joe and Nathan uh, Fuller, who is the head of the Courage Foundation that defends Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning and, uh, and Edward Snowden and myself, and we're going to fight for the fundamental right of free speech for one individual who published the truth about the horrors of all US wars, the slaughter of American imperialism, and they wanna put him in jail for that. That's why UNAC champions Julian Assange and why we champion Mumia Abu-Jamal, who is a classic case of the racist 
nature of the prison industrial <laughs> complex, mass imprisonment complex that puts millions of people in jail with the framework of the school to prison scenario of racist America. That's why we champion these fights for democratic rights, whether it be Mumia's freedom or Julian Assange or Chelsea Manning or Edward Snowden or everyone else who struggles against the machine to get the truth out. And to do that, we need a broad movement, a united front, a mass movement. And that's what we aspire to build. Join us. Thank you, Jeff. All right, I'm gonna ask one last question. We'll leave it there. If people want to see um, a rebroadcast of this, it will be on the UNAX YouTube channel, um, probably tomorrow or the day after. But uh, we've got a, a question, I'm gonna ask it in a more generic sense than he did from Paul Fraser, who's from the Catholic Worker and the Upstate Anti-Drone Network. He asked basically the question of why isn't the anti-war movement doing better? Um, you know, why aren't we doing what we've seen during other periods in our history, maybe the beginning days of uh, the Iraq War or the um, Vietnam War period, when we were able to bring millions of people out in the streets um, and uh, we were able to have a, a greater effect with people in the military and people in society um, uh, in general. And what can we do to correct that? Um, does anybody have any thoughts on that or that they'd like to say? This is a whole subject, but if we can briefly start talking about that, and maybe we can continue that in, in the meeting that we will have later in February. I saw Margaret's hand up. Margaret? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been discussed already on this uh, Zoom that, you know, people in the United States are struggling. Many of people in the United States are struggling, you know, just to, to survive right now. And so when you're faced with your immediate needs, what seems very distant, you know, the wars, maybe a lower priority. And so it's really critical that the anti-war movement reach out to people directly and make these connections between how our foreign policy impacts and hurts us at home. And I think there's a lot of efforts to do that. And one that we haven't mentioned yet is a project of the US Peace Council, Money for Human Needs about, you know, we've talked about defunding the police. We need to defund the Pentagon and shift that, you know, we need to close the bases. We need to uh, start, you know, being a positive force uh, at home and, and around the world instead of a death machine. So um, I think that it's really important. That's why with the sanctions toolkit, we're trying to reach people to help them understand that we are also facing an economic war here at home and it has the same root causes. And then also just showing folks that, you know, the anti-war movement has a plan, you know, that it's working together, that it, you know, has clear goals and it has a strategy to achieve those goals and ways that people can easily plug in uh, to the work. I think that's a responsibility that we have as, you know, an anti-war movement. And then just finally, I wanted to really quickly comment on one person who raised the question about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, because this is something that we need to be aware of as well. You know, President Biden, uh, President Biden, <laughs> oh, Biden, Obama and Biden were very strong pushers of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And it was actually the reason that Trump was able to kind of use that as an issue is because the Democrats were so strong on pushing that and it made him popular with the Rust Belt states that had really been hurt by outsourcing of jobs and things like that. And so now the, you know, when the US dropped out under President Trump, the other countries went ahead and negotiated and signed an agreement, the comprehensive, it's the CPTPP. And now that Biden is back in power, he's being pushed by Chamber of Commerce and others to rejoin that agreement. And this fits very much in line with Biden's political or you know, foreign policy strategy, which was the same under Obama, of great power conflict and trying to isolate and surround China. So this is um, an agreement that will be really harmful to people in the United States in a whole range of ways. And we were able to mobilize a huge movement of movements against that, uh, that stopped that. And uh, so just something else to put on our radar because Biden, uh, you know, is already antagonizing China with ships going into the South China Sea and things like that. And so, um, and is gonna probably be putting a lot of energy there. And so we have to recognize that this trade agreement is also part of that war against China and oppose it just as much. I'll stop there. And Joe, very quickly, I think that uh, Margaret touched on a number of points. I think one of the main, one of the main challenges of the anti-war and anti-imperialist movement in the U.S. is some strategic focus. 
Um, secondly, we have to be uh, more creative in how we are attempting to uh, reach the public um, and how we message. Uh, and third, we have to recognize the, the difficulties of, of trying to raise the, visi the visibility of the movement in the midst of this pandemic uh, and how we are confined to our homes and communities. You know, we, we have these various petitions on our site and everybody else is circulating petitions because we can't really do much more than that at this point, it appears. Well, we should be out in the street and raising the visibility of the movement. We are confined to these, these kinds of, of activities. Well, we have to be creative in that also in terms of, of, of using to the extent that we can the media, in particular the alternative media to raise these issues of war and peace. Um, but the main thing is trying to cut through all of the attempts to try to keep the, uh, the issue sidelined for the, for the U.S. public uh, and constantly try to raise these issues. But the only way we can do it is through a more concentrated, strategically focused efforts. Thank you, General. Autumn. So... <clears throat> Uh, there are a great number of difficulties facing the anti-war movement that, um, you know, I'm sure have appeared before that, you know, may, many veterans of the movement may recognize. But um, uh, in my time with the anti-war movement, one thing I have, you know, noticed is that sort of which movement takes center stage will, of course, fluctuate over the years. Um, a couple years ago here in Minneapolis, like the big focus was on immigrant justice work because this was when the caravan from Honduras was in the news all the time. It's when there was a lot more focus on the concentration camps at the, at the border. Um, of course, over the summer uh, in the aftermath of the police murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, the movement for Black Lives was the centrally focused uh, movement for peace and justice in the United States. Um, the, you know, in, in those moments, like, you know, the anti-war movement isn't the number one priority in people's minds because their more immediate, more tangible concerns were center st stage at the time. Uh, <clears throat> additionally, uh, a big success of the, uh, U.S. media apparatus, you know, we're talking about, you know, something like 95% of all media outlets being owned by six corporations who are themselves deeply invested in U.S. hegemony, um, you know, pushing these narratives of, you know, of these, uh, against these uh, countries that the U.S. has targeted, that the U.S. is uh, standing against. Um, you won't hear an honest analysis on the situation in Venezuela from the Washington Post, which is owned by Jeff Bezos, right? Um, and even some, what some people consider more progressive publications will say, oh, well, Iran's this like brutal theocracy where people can be killed for any old reason. Um, and these are supposedly, big air quotes, trustworthy news sources. So a lot of the countries that we in the anti-war movement, you know, stand in solidarity with against U.S. imperialism are ones that people are constantly told, no, this is not a safe place for human beings to be. They, you know, name a group that you're, that you're, um, <clears throat> uh, in sort of like weaponizing the concerns of so-called progressives and, and such, um, it's really easy to be like, oh, well, you're, Hey, Autumn, you're a member of the LGBT community, right? Well, don't you know they're mistreated in this target, uh, in this country that the U.S. is targeting? Like, that's not, even if it's true, that's not the point, dude. Um, it's just they, there are all these different ways that you can weaponize people's seemingly legitimate concerns against them to turn them against the uh, righteous struggle against U.S. imperialism. Um, and so that's kind of the big challenge. Um, I think I'll close out with uh, speaking of, you know, how to build the movement, right? Youth Against Empire is actually coordinating some national days of action 
uh, around Iran, um, February 18th through the 21st. We will have that up on uh, the UNAC Facebook page. We'll have our flyer up and we'll encourage uh, component groups of UNAC all around the country to participate in these days of actions. Um, here in Minneapolis, we're going to be uh, actually outside safely and socially distanced in order to uh, bring awareness to the uh, current U.S. conflict with Iran. Um, like Ajamu said, like that the ability to take the streets and to be visibly present in these sort of situations is still an invaluable resource that we need to take advantage of if we can, however we can, safely. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to whoever else wants to talk about it. Let me just say a couple of things to think about. First of all, we in upstate New York, where I live in my local peace group, we continue to hold weekly vigils and we've kind of upscaled it a little bit because we have had more people coming out than before. And one of the reasons was because of the protests around Black Lives. Um, we had a gigantic demonstration of in this small little town where I live, 1,000 people who lined the streets, kept socially distant six feet apart, um, and it was a, had a tremendous impact. So we continue to do a socially distanced um, uh, event, and once a month now we're starting to turn that into a more of a speak out where people will have a speaker system and people can come up and talk about the various issues. And it's become an integral part of the whole community here. It's known um, uh, very well. Uh, because of that. So I think we can do some of that. Another thing to think about is there was a real discontinuity in the movement. When I was young and organizing around the Vietnam War movement, the majority of people were young that were in the movement. We had a, a problem with trying to get older people in because we called it a generation gap and there was a youth culture involved and so forth. Um, and then there was a whole generation that we kind of lost, the me generation and everybody wanted to be a um, uh, entrepreneur or something like that. And then, you know, the wars in Iraq and the uh, Gulf War and 9-11 uh, and the aggressive nature of the United States and the attacks um, uh, on unions, the attacks on minority communities, the attacks on immigrants, all sorts of things happened and people started coming out again. But there was this break, this discontinuity between the older people and the younger people, which is still the problem, I think, in terms of getting younger people involved in the anti-war movement to some extent. It does have the reputation of being an older movement, and we have to get away from that because it, it really impacts because the wars at home and the wars abroad are not separated um, by any uh, means at all. So, um, there, there's a bunch of things we can talk about, about building the movement, but one of them, again, is unity. And that's where we have, that's where, you know, there's UNAC. So we can bring together the various organizations to try to fight around what we can and try to get a critical mass that can make our movement um, move it more towards central stage in people's minds and help bring international issues to the very important immediate issues that, that Autumn talked about, and I think that's very important. And these are some of the things I think we'll talk about in that UNAC meeting, uh, which I mentioned, which will go out in the UNAC emails, and you'll all hear about it, and you'll all, all get it. Let's just see if there's any last comment, and then we'll, we'll take off from there. Any last comment on the issue? All right, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, it's unique that instead of talking about a specific subject on one of these webinars that we talked about the movement and we had to by necessity talk about the various subjects in the various countries. Unlike the Vietnam War, which was a central focus of the anti-war movement, there were wars all over the world. There are sanctions in 39 countries. There are coups happening all over the world. There's um, a United States in 172 countries. There's all sorts of other issues that are, are, are being felt by people during this period of a declining capitalism. Um, so we did talk about that, but we need to continue to have this discussion and we need to figure out how um, we, during this period of the Biden administration, when a number of people are taking a deep breath and relaxing a little bit, let people know that it's not time to do that. It's time to organize and organize strongly. Um, 
um, because we have to build a movement um, to end the wars at home and abroad. And uh, if we don't, the Biden administration will not be able to do this for us. And we might move back uh, in a more right-wing direction in the future. Um, it's uh, we who have to, uh, have to uh, lead the kind of movement that we're talking about. Anything else? Okay, well, folks, thank you all for joining today. This will be on YouTube, uh, the discussion tomorrow or the next day. Um, it will go out on a, a future UNAC emailing. I'd like to thank the participants, the UNAC Administrative Committee, and all of those who joined us uh, uh, today. Thank you all. Take care.